an honour, as always, to rise in this House and represent the great people of Timmins James Bay who put their trust in me to represent the issues uh, in this House. You know, today, Mr. Speaker, on the Hill, uh, outside Parliament, reminded me why I love this country so much. I think of Parliament Hill, that great public space where people come to demonstrate, where people come to play drums, where people come to f have frisbees, and yes, on 420, where they come and smoke pot uh, to try and draw attention. This is a public space. And in that great public space today, hundreds, perhaps thousands of people gathered in support of the people of Boston. It shows that at the are f most fundamental that we are a world community and we care for each other in those moments. And I, I watched the crowd go off to the sounds of Sweet Caroline, uh, one of the great songs. I used to sing it at weddings, but that's another story, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thought of Fenway Park in Boston where, where Neil Diamond showed up and sang Sweet Caroline, showing the great spirit in Boston that senseless violence will not deter us from being a civil society. And whether it is the horrific killings in Boston, or whether it's the crazy gun nuts in Newton or in Colorado, that a fundamental principle of our society is we're not going to let them win by growing in fear and undermining the basic principles on which our society has been based. And that principle is based on the right of citizens to be protected, protected certainly from terrorists, but also protected from arbitrary arrest an arbitrary detainment. That is the principle of what this House of Commons stands for. Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate that as we saw that great outpouring of goodwill on the Hill within this House, we see this debate being brought back forward again. I want to refer to the Globe and Mail editorial that says that this two-day debate in Parliament on the government's proposed anti-terror legislation smacks of political opportunism. And it is regretful that it will take place. The debate politicizes the Boston Marathon bombings. It goes on to say that more worrying is the fact that there are aspects of the proposed bill that raise questions about balancing civil liberties with the need to protect citizens. A wise course of action would be to postpone the bill's final reading so that any emotional fallout from the Boston bombing doesn't color this important debate about public safety in Canada. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's really incumbent upon us when we see this political opportunism in the face of such tragedy, that we don't just bend with the wind when the Conservatives say bend. Our colleagues in the Liberal Party, well, they bent long ago on this issue, Mr. Speaker. But we need to raise the fundamental issues that are facing Canadians. What we're talking about is legislation that takes away basic fundamental rights. The right uh, that they could detain you without trial, and that they could make you go before special investigative juries or judges where you would not have the right to remain silent. Those are fundamental principles. So if, we are, if Parliament is going to undermine those basic rights on which democratic freedoms are based, there has to be some damn good reasons that that's taking place, Mr. Speaker. We see that the, the original bill, this, these original measures were brought forward by the Liberal government in the post-9-11 era and, and in the horror after 9-11. There were many people who said that our traditional freedoms uh, were outdated. That in the 21st century, torture and rendition and detention without trial, that was what we needed to do in order to protect society. And Mr. Speaker, we saw many, many abuses of public, uh, of the, of, in the public realm of citizens' rights under this uh, sense of fear and panic and, and the Liberal government at the time went along with that George Bush analysis and they brought in these provisions. The provisions right now that are being brought back, they brought them in but even at that time they were so unpalatable to the Canadian public that they had to guarantee that there would be a sunset clause, that they would only do them for a period of time and within that period of time those provisions were never found to be necessary, not once. And yet the Liberals are still wanting to break that promise that they made to Canadians where they said they would sunset these clauses because they were such a basic threat to basic uh, democratic and legal rights. But now the Liberals are saying, let's do it. Let's forget that sunset clause. Let's forget the debate that happened in 2007 where the House of Commons said 
that those kind of provisions that would take away fundamental rights for people for legal protection, that the House of Commons rejected that in 2007 and the Liberals voted with us, but now again they're going back to where they wanted to be. And this is the party, Mr. Speaker, that always wraps themselves that it was them with the Charter, that they represented the Charter, but these are fundamental Charter issues. Mr. Speaker, they use the word terrorism, and it's certainly uh, a, a very loaded word and a very dangerous uh, issue that we're facing. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the issue with this bill is that as parliamentarians, we have to make sure due diligence is done so that, on, that innocent people will not be drawn up in this net. And it was really telling, Mr. Speaker, where we brought forward a number of amendments to try and fix this bill, to work with this government to fix this bill. The Liberal, gov Liberal members brought zero amendments. They just went along to rubber stamp it. But one of the motions that we tried to bring forward was on the issue of recognizance with conditions where you could be held uh, with preventative arrest based on the word of a peace officer, that you could be just held without a, without a warrant, without charges, and someone who knew somebody who may be a threat could also be held. And so we tried to clarify the language so that we were really clear about what was, what was intended, so that it was terror suspects and not just average citizens who are out there uh, protesting in the streets or who just would get caught up in a sweep. And the government refused that amendment because they said they wanted a broad sweep. And that's something that my honourable colleagues and the Liberals are supporting. They're saying that that would, that would pass a charter challenge. I certainly don't think so. Mr. Speaker, what preventative arrest, what recognizance with conditions really means, we have to look at where it's been done. We think in the post-2001-9-11 era when Mayor Arar was arrested without any real evidence, was, went through rendition and was tortured, and that was done under the nose of the, the then Liberal government who thought that that was just the price you have to pay for freedom. And then we found out later that Mayor Harar was completely innocent. We see, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are saying, well, this doesn't mean that if you serve a meal in a restaurant to a supposed terrorist, you're going to be arrested. Well, without warrant. Well, that's a ridiculous example, Mr. Speaker. A more telling example would be to look in England during the 1970s and the horrific bombing campaigns that hit London and Birmingham. And the time, Parliament at that time, felt, oh, we have to get rid of the basic principles, habeas corpus, get rid of the principles of um, uh, trial and detention, or detention without trial. And they arrested numerous innocent people, including, and I've mentioned this before today, the story of Annie McGuire, who was just a housewife. And not only Annie McGuire, but seven members of her family were put in jail for 15 years based on no evidence, because they were thought to somehow be associated with people who were terrorists. Well, the people that they were associated with, their cousins, were innocent. And in the Guilford bombings, we saw that a great miscarriage of justice was done, and people's lives were ruined. But it was considered okay at the time because, you know what, they're all a threat. The crime, of course, then was that they were Irish in England. But civil society is based on the rule of law. It's based on ensuring that those situations don't happen. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to just talk about the term terrorist. You know, I was called a terrorist. I was denounced by the government of Mike Harris as an eco-terrorist because I was standing up against a massive garbage dump that the, in front of many of those front benchers supported. And when, as a citizen, when I was speaking up and protesting, we were being called eco-terrorists. We see the government uses that word all the time. If you don't like a pipeline, you're an eco-terrorist. What about all the young Aboriginal activists who are on the streets? What about the people at the G20 who came from all over and got off the buses to to um, participate in their demonstrations at the G20, which is their fundamental right. Well, under this law, a peace officer could believe they might be possibly thinking of terrorist activity, and they could be held for detention 24 hours, no charges. And then they could decide whether to let them go. Well, we saw what happened in the G20, and that's exactly what they were doing. They were detaining people, they were kettling people, and of course they missed all the bad guys who were running up and down Queen Street with black masks on. I don't know how they missed them, they managed to run all the way from Queen and Spadina all, all the way up Young Street, but they managed to detain a lot of innocent people. So you have to be careful, you have to define 
exactly what you mean. Because if you allow just a police officer, just someone in authority to decide, I don't like that person, I think they pose a threat, that they can be detained without trial. In this bill, they, people can be held for 12 months without any real, without a conviction. Now, the government says they need this, but you know, Mr. Speaker, in the years that these provisions were brought in, it was never used once. And under Article 495 in the Code, already they can bring an order to have someone appear before a judge. And a judge already has the ability to detain them and, without releasing them without bail if they feel that they are a threat. Those powers already exist. But, Mr. Speaker, we're talking about new powers that are much more arbitrary, that are much more subjective, that allows for people to be picked up and be held without charges. That's a fundamental threat, Mr. Speaker. I think I'd like to quote on this as Paul Copeland, the law, a lawyer with the Law Union of Ontario. He says, in my opinion, the provisions that you are examining here in committee will unnecessarily change our legal landscape in Canada. We must not adopt them. In my opinion, they are not necessary. Other provisions of the code provide various mechanisms for dealing with such individuals. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate that within the opposition, the Liberals didn't think to even challenge, not even clarify. There's some other amendments that are very, very needed that this government refused. For example, Bill, C -S or Bill S7, it's a law of general application. So it, it cuts right across. The Young Offenders Act doesn't supersede Bill S7. So that's very concerning because what happens to people who are under 18? Can they be detained? Can they be held? That happened in the case of Annie McGuire in Ireland. To say it wouldn't happen is absurd. It has happened. And Canada has legal obligations under the International Human Rights Convention to ensure in the rights of the child to protect children. Now, there was questions the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children proposed amendments to the bill to ensure that the implementation for children under 18 would consider the Convention on the Rights of Children, including detention as a last resort. And the government didn't accept those amendments, and neither did the Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, that's serious. You know, what we're told here, and I've been here for a number of years, and I'm always told, well, you know, if you guys are you're soft on this, you're soft on this, what I find the government is soft on is the basic principle of the rule of law. That whenever, whenever it's convenient, if someone says, hey, let's get rid of the rule of law, it'll be more effective. Well, certainly it'll be more effective. Totalitarian states, totalitarian states are always very effective at a certain thing because they don't have the rule of law. We are different because we have the rule of law. And I'll point to Bill C-30 in this last parliament where the government came in with massive provisions to, to, to allow government undefined legal authorities to demand personal information on internet users and cell phone users without warrant. They thought that that was perfectly okay. They needed this. And if we didn't support that, what did they say? They said that we were soft on child pornography. What an ugly, ugly statement, considering the fact that the one who came forward who was very soft on child pornography was the architect of the whole conservative revolution, Tom Flanagan. Now, Tom Flanagan was soft on child pornography. But average Canadians who wanted to protect their privacy rights were attacked by this government. The other provisions within Bill C-30 at that time, that they were forcing telecoms to put in spyware so that they could track people whenever they wanted. And my colleagues in the Liberal Party said nothing about it because those were actually provisions that were brought forward under the Liberals. Now, we saw at that time a huge backlash publicly. It was, it was very impressive. Canadians care about their privacy rights. And Canadians are not soft on child pornography. And Canadians are not soft on terrorism. But they were not going to sit back and allow this government to undermine basic rights, including the issue that if you're going to wiretap, you need warrants. Now, we see recently the government came back with Bill C-55, which is on wiretap provisions, and they recognized the need to have warrants. And at none of this, Mr. Speaker, precludes the issue that already within the court system of this country, if an officer believes a life's in danger, they can act. They can act without a warrant. That's a reasonable provision. If there's something that's an emergency of a child's life's at stake, they can act. And they can then explain it to the judge. 
But we're talking about something different. We're talking about someone who feels that a bunch of young activists from Montreal who come to Toronto for the G20 and get off the bus, well, they could be up to no good. And it's perfectly okay to grab them and put them in detention for 24 hours and then decide. Well, maybe we'll let them go. Well, maybe the demonstration will be off by then. We know that CSIS has been keeping tabs on young Aboriginal activists. So are we going to say, well, they'll be drawn up in this because they wanted a broad sweep. Those were their terms. They wanted a broad sweep. And I, I speak to people, Mr. Speaker, back home to really reflect on what this House is being asked to push through here. Provisions, the provisions of law have served us for hundreds of years. They're not arbitrary. They didn't just come up with them. They exist because they, we've seen the abuse of civil rights. We've seen the abuse of individual rights. And we need a clear set of rule of law. So even in the case of terrorism, Mr. Speaker, what we say in the Democratic Party is we need the tools. If the government wanted tools to go after cyber terrorists, then bring in a bill that goes after cyber terrorists. But don't bring in a bill that allows them to grab any information on anybody they want at any time just because. It's the just because is not good enough. And Mr. Speaker, I find it very unfortunate that in the wake of the Boston bombings, this incoherent, uh, horrific act, that the government has been widely seen by to try and force this through, to wrap themselves in the, in the grief of Boston in order to push this bill through with their friends in the Liberal Party that is undermining the basic rights of Canadians without having ever proven just cause. Because again, Mr. Speaker, in the years that these provisions existed under the Liberals, before the Liberals agreed to a sunset clause, they were never used. We see that within the criminal code, we have numerous provisions to give police the powers they need to go after the bad guys when they need it. What we need to do as parliamentarians is not to be frightened, told by the Conservatives that we all have to jump when they say jump, otherwise we're soft. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're not soft. And we're not soft-headed, unlike our colleagues over in the third party. We stand for the rule of law in this country. And if this government is going to fundamentally alter the political landscape of this country, then they need to come and prove it. And number two, they need to stop politicizing it so that when amendments are brought before the committee to ensure, for example, that children are not drawn up in this wide sweep, that they say, that's reasonable. Okay, we will protect children. And then when we ask for amendments to clarify what are terrorists, so it's not just some guy in a uniform picking some kid out of a crowd and saying, you know what, you look like you're about to do something. That is not the rule of law, Mr. Speaker. That is what exists in totalitarian countries, and it's the difference between us and them. Mr. Speaker, I want to refer to the uh, National Criminal Justice Section, uh, Paul Kalako of the Canadian Bar Association, who, who put it very clearly at the committee. He said, there is no question that the prevention of terrorist action is vital to preserving our society. This requires effective legislation, but also legislation that respects the traditions of our democracy. Unfortunately, this bill fails to meet either goal. Mr. Speaker, in the time I have left, I'd like to talk to some of the... I was just getting started, Mr. Speaker. I think the issue is on the investigative hearings, where someone can be brought before a special judge, and the right to remain silent, which is a fundamental principle, is taken away from them without any justification, without a necessary explanation of why these individuals are being stripped of these rights. It's just on the subjective word of a legal authority. As well, the recognizance with conditions of preventative arrests, not just of people who are suspected, but people who may know them, people who may be their relatives. That a peace agent can arrest an individual without a warrant if they believe it's necessary and hold them for 24 hours. And that we see that then people can be held for up to a year. I think, Mr. Speaker, it is incumbent upon us in the aftermath of this horrific um, and senseless act in Boston that we say that as civil society, we're not going to give in to knee-jerk reactions. We're not going to give in to fear. We're going to stand 
with the victims, but we're going to ensure that they are not used to undermine the very basis of what makes us a civil and progressive and democratic society. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Question et commentaire. The Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleague for uh, his, his speech. And we would hate for uh, accuracy or the truth to interrupt a full flight of rhetoric that we see from the member uh, from Kenora, uh, Rainy River. But my question to him was, he used the, uh, the picture to this house of a group of students getting off a bus or some protesters going to, to protest, which is part of our right uh, as a Canadian to do. But considering parts of this act were previously law in Canada, uh, I'd ask the member, can he point to an example where that occurred? Because other members of his caucus and, and uh, people in the House today uh, have mentioned that the, most of the powers in this act were not called upon when they were enforced. So what is he basing his, his analogy on? The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my Honourable Colleague. I'd like to let him know that Northern Ontario is bigger than Kenora Rainy River. I'm actually from Timmins, James Bay, but no matter. What I said was very clear. But the G20. Perhaps he doesn't remember the G20 and the massive abuses of civil rights that happened in the G20, all in the name of going after, I don't know, was it the Black Mask Anarchists? They missed all them, but they arbitrarily held people and then let them go said, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. That happened. Now, if these provisions are so badly needed, why was it that under the four years after 9-11, when the terror, supposed terror threat was at its highest, they were never even used because police didn't need them? Now they're being brought back. They were such onerous provisions that the government agreed to put a sunset clause to get rid of them because they do represent a fundamental threat. So I'd like to remind my honourable colleague, also, he wasn't here then, but Mayor Harar, Mayor Arar was dragged out, a Canadian citizen who was sent off to Syria and tortured. And everyone in this House on the Liberal and Conservative side at the time thought that that was what was needed to defend democracy. Meanwhile, this was a completely innocent man whose only crime was the colour of his skin. So yeah, it has happened. And if this bill is brought forward, it'll happen again. Questions and comments? Question and comment The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, you know, it's interesting in listening to the, to the member speak, and if you were to, to read uh, what it is he said, you would, one would think that it was the Liberal Party that was in government, um, and that might come in a couple of years, but I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, if you reflect in terms of what it is that he said, it's, you know, the Liberal Party this, the Liberal Party that, and, you know, we want to put some facts on, on the record. Yeah, the Liberal Party will take uh, full credit for the Charter of Rights. The Liberal Party traditionally has demonstrated very strong support in legislative form, in constitutional form, in standing up for individual rights. But the Liberal Party also recognizes that terrorism is, is something that is very real and it's there today. If, a t if you provide a tool in the toolbox for a law enforcement agency and they never use the tool, doesn't mean that the tool is useless. There could be opportunities or there might be uh, situations that arise in the future where the tool could in fact be effective. Can the member indicate uh, to the House, to, to people that might be even viewing or listening to what it is that he's saying, why it is he believes that when you have law uh, enforcement officers and other experts that are coming forward yeah, saying that there is advantages and there is a need for S uh, S7, that there is a need for it, why it is that he and the NDP believe uh, that there is no need for it because it walks on an individual's rights when even we had the Supreme Court of Canada indicate uh, that investigative uh, hearings are in fact uh, constitutional. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's all kinds of tools you can put in a toolbox. You can get a screwdriver, you can put a big jackhammer. The question is, how do you use them? Now, I, I, obviously, I don't ever expect to see the Liberals in government again because they flip-flop. 
and they misrepresent themselves to Canadians. They promised Canadians in 2001 when they brought these provisions in that they would sunset them because they recognized they were a fundamental threat. Now what we see, as soon as we got a Conservative majority, the Liberals get to hide behind them, run up the road with them and say, we want to suspend these fundamental civil liberties. They can howl all they want, Mr. Speaker, but that is the historical record. So they come out every few months and wrap themselves in the so-called charter but they were the ones who brought in the provisions that had Mayor Arar tortured. They did nothing to help him when he was over in Syria being tortured. They left him there because they thought these provisions were okay. So we have continued to stand up for the basic defense of civil liberties, and we will continue to stand up. If they want to vote with the Conservatives, it makes no difference to us. There's a reason they're the third party. There's a reason that that third party will stay the third party, Mr. Speaker. And the Questions and comments? Kestoe Kamantaib, the Honourable Member for York South Weston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend from Timmins James Bay for putting this so plainly and bluntly in front of Canadians here today that there is a party here that would like to defend the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, would like to defend Article 9, which says that everyone has the right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. This law, this law changes that right for innocent people who will no longer have the right to say that that charter will protect them. And the, this party defends the charter. The party to my right maybe put the charter in, but that was a different Trudeau and a different party. Would my, would my friend like to comment? The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I think, uh, you know, when Canadians look at these issues, they want clear choices. I might disagree with the Conservative Party on almost everything, although there's a few Bruins fans over there, I think. But I do recognize that they offer Canadians a clear choice. We, on the other hand, will stand for the rule of law. We will stand for the protection of basic rights because we believe that. The difference is the party over in the, in the corner that's howling and screaming at the moon that brought zero amendments, zero amendments. And then they had the nerve today to stand up and say, oh, the Conservatives don't listen to us, we bring amendments. Well, how could they listen to you if you're not speaking? I mean, what an absolute waste. They get paid to read legislation that has profound effects for undermining the basic rights of the rule of law, and they go along with it, and then they stand up today, and all day they said, oh, you know what, those Conservatives have been mean to us, because what we really wanted to talk about was a motion to allow Conservative backbenchers to change their motions and the statements. Now, really, Mr. Speaker, with all the issues that are facing people in the world, in Canada today, you would think that the new leader from Papineau would have thought in his first opposition motion, the issues of democracy or the issues of accountability or pensions, he could have done that, but no. He thought political mischief with the Conservatives, I don't really, it doesn't matter to me how the Conservatives decide to do their statements, that's their business. But do you really think anybody out there in the real world gives a monkey's rear end about how they deba debate statements in the House and that's his first Opposition Day motion. That's his idea of defending the... Order. Questions and comments? Kestioni Kamantai, the Honourable Minister of State for Transportation. One minute and one minute answer. Okay, well, well uh, as we see the NDP continue with their hug a thug, kiss a terrorist uh, approach, um, this is a very serious uh, bill. And the member says the only thing that's separating Canada from uh, a totalitarian state is this bill. That's what he said. I'm afraid this member does not understand Canada. He does not understand uh, our freedoms. And he has done a disservice by putting down our nation as well as um, uh, minimizing the suffering for those who do live in uh, those types of uh, nations. Um, if the member talks about civil rights, why did he vote against the meritor? Uh, equal matrimonial rights last week. Look, the NDP uh, talk a lot, but they do not do as they say. Order. The Honourable Member for Tim and James Bay, you have a little less than a minute. Well, Mr. Speaker, I won't stay very long on this hug-a-thug talking down the nation. It's really unfortunate that that member 
can't even involve himself in a serious discussion without reverting to some university conservative party talking points. We're talking about the rule of law here. That's what we're talking about. He might think, well, I'll just get some quick notes from the 20-year-old runs up in the PMO and I'll look smart. But we're talking about a bill that the Globe and Mail said today was legislation that smacks of political opportunism and is unfortunately politicizing the Boston Marathon bombing. He needs to stop wrapping himself in the flag because I think it's affecting his thinking. We need to talk about what this issue is, which is the right of citizens to be free from arbitrary arrest in this country. Resuming